Our scripture today comes from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 through chapter 4, verse 5, and is printed in the bulletin if you'd like to read along. You can just listen along if you'd rather. Let us hear the word. But as for you, continue, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I solemnly urge you, proclaim the message. Be persistent whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. Convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander Away to myths. As for you, always be sober, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, carry out your ministry fully. May God add blessing and understanding to the hearing of this word this day. I saw this book on my brother in law's um, shelf. If you've been to Starbucks, you know that little thing that goes around the cup? That's on this book. It's kind of fun. It's the Starbucks experience. It is an opportunity to learn from a company that's done well. We're not a company. We're not a corporation. And yet, I think sometimes there are things to learn. And so I bring to you some ideas from this book to start our sermon this day. In it, there's an article written by the Corporate Design Foundation which is a nonprofit education and research organization dedicated to improving effectiveness of business. And this is kind of a summary of their experience when they've gone to Starbucks, and this is their report. They say, The Starbucks sensation is driven not just by the quality of its product, but by the entire atmosphere surrounding the purchase of coffee, the openness of its store, interesting menu boards, the shape of its counter, the cleanliness of the floorboards. While Starbucks recognized long before its imitators was that the art of retailing coffee went way beyond product. The details of the total experience mattered. Did you hear that? The details of the total experience mattered. Every particular, from napkins to coffee bags, to storefront to window seats, annual reports to mail order catalogs, tabletops to thermal carafes. All of this seems to reflect the authentic and organic roots of Starbucks. Let that ponder in your head for just a moment. They hired a guy named Timothy Jones. And Timothy Jones was hired, he was a former record store owner. And he was hired by Starbucks to create a playlist Have you been to Starbucks? Part of the experience is music, and the music is the same no matter what Starbucks you're in. His job was to create the musical experience for Starbucks, to enhance the experience. He said the higher-ups, the bosses, understood something way before a lot of other people. Just like the report said, it's more than coffee. It's an opportunity for people to come and have an experience. He said, when people come to Starbucks, it is way bigger than coffee. Can we learn from that as a church? I think we can. I think we can understand that everything matters. From the smallest detail to the biggest detail. From the moment that people come to our parking lot to the moment they sit down here till they go home again. Everything matters. 
And for us in church, it doesn't matter for our, our glory. It doesn't matter for our own sake. But it matters for faith's sake. It matters that we can help people come closer to God. Everything matters. But it's not just for a church to know that. For you, as an individual, for me, as an individual, everything matters. If I'm going to say that I believe, if I'm going to say yes and get into that baptistry and go down one person and rise a new person, of course, that's our tradition. There are other ways to commit yourself to your faith. But if you're going to commit yourself to your faith, then everything from that moment matters. At least... That's what Paul reminds us today. Now I say Paul, but it's really not Paul. First and Second Timothy and Titus. These three books are held together for most scholars in one context. They're called the pastoral epistles. And they kind of give order to the church, the early church, the way back when church, when there was only one church, Catholic, which means universal. There were some uprisings that came to try to overthrow those who were building the church. But these books kept people from being able to do that. They talk about these two Timothys and Titus. They talk about um, truths, spiritual and biblical truths. They talk about how to order a church. They talk about all of these things that help the church endure for centuries when uprisings would come. But there is an issue. Paul didn't write it, according to most scholars today. The other thing that these three books do is they kind of cement Paul as one of the leaders of the church. They kind of make it that this is Paul's going away party. If you read on into chapter 4, starting in verse 6, you will hear some very famous words. As for me, you know, in what he was writing to us, he being whoever was the writer, we're being told how we can live. And then the very next 4, 6 says, as for me, I am being poured out as a libation. Do you remember that famous passage? I have run the race. I have fought the good fight. What great words more than likely written by a disciple of Paul who was trying to honor this great man, this great witness of faith, this great builder of the church. See, we don't do that today. If I write something like that and say, I'm Paul, I'll be charged. My paper won't get graded. I'll fail my class. We think it's plagiarism. It's the difference in our cultures. It's the difference in our cultures. So does it matter? Is Paul still a great builder of the church? Is Paul still a great witness of faith? For some, it does. It doesn't matter much to me. So if, if for you, you need to understand that Paul wrote those words, it's like Paul wrote those words because his students wrote them for him. I'm good either way. The words are good, always. They remind us that there are going to be difficult times, and in those difficult times, we can live faith. In fact, that we have to live our faith. It's our call, because living our faith prepares us for salvation. That time when Jesus will rule. I like the end. I like the end. That itching ears piece, have you ever heard that phrase? I thought it was great. Because people will have itching ears. They're going to turn away from the truth that you know. They're going to turn away from the baptism that you've experienced. They're going to move on to myths and turn away from this scripture. Because they're going to have itching ears. 
Have you ever had itching ears? Have you ever strayed from your faith or doubted? We get that. It's just nature. It's part of it. But in our day, we may need to pay heed to these words that the disciples of Paul have written because people are having itching ears. We talked about it before, but the largest growing religion in the United States today is atheism. People are turning away from the church. We are called. This scripture today reminds us that we are called to give it our all in every moment, to leave nothing undone. The sermon title, Leave Nothing Undone, actually comes from uh, oh, the living word translation of the Bible. I was in Oklahoma, and my brother-in-law doesn't necessarily have the same translations that I would use here. And so I had to use what I had available to me. It was the Living Word Translation. And it used that phrase, leave nothing undone. The New Revised Standard Version, which we use in our worship services, does not use that translation, but it's a good translation. It's a good word for us. It was in that encouragement part where we are told to stay sober and to be persistent and to keep going. Leave nothing undone. This is our call as disciples, as true followers. We have to give it our all because there are people who need to hear from us. Brian McLaren in his book, Naked Spirituality, he reminds us that to be able to give it our all, we have to say yes to God. He even says that um, there is an initial yes. That time when you first commit yourself to your faith. And he says that that first commitment to faith is probably an overwhelming experience in some way, in some point in time. There was this big moment of yes to God. And then it's followed up by a lot of other Yeses. Sometimes it's baptism. Sometimes it's confirmation. It just depends on your faith tradition. And then he says even coming to the communion table and coming to worship each Sunday is a yes. Each time you do that, each time you come, you are saying yes to your faith. He warns against complacency. He writes, To say yes to doing good and then be ignored to say yes to doing right and then be misunderstood and criticized. To say yes to being loving and then to be vilified and even crucified. This is the territory into which we will all someday be invited. This is the yes of not my will, but your will be done. Powerful words. He quotes Thich Nhat Hanh, who is a Vietnamese um, Buddhist monk who lives in the south of France at a place called Plum Village. And this Buddhist monk from Vietnam writes these words. At Plum Village, I teach the young people a simple verse to practice while walking. We, 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 as they breathe in. And Merci, 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 as they breathe out. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks, thanks, thanks. I want them to respond to life, to society, and to the earth in a positive way. They enjoy it very much. This is a newer book. Red Letter Revolution. It's written by Tony Campolo and Shane Claiborne. It is an opportunity to address the red letter parts of the Bible. Anybody know what the red letter parts of the Bible are? That's where Jesus spoke. They want to say, what if Jesus really meant what he said? And beyond that, if Jesus really meant what he said, how are we supposed to respond? 
Shane writes of someone that he knows who is Catholic, who has um, just lived a life of faith, that he's built communities and that he's gone to prison and that he's helped people all the time. This man, this great person of faith, was approached by someone one time who said, don't you just look at all the misery in the world? Don't you just see all the bad and get so overwhelmed? How do you keep going? And this man said, every morning, after I wake up, I curl up like a little baby and I lay in God's arms and I hear the words, I love you. Claiborne goes on to say, it's just enough for you to think that God does love us, that God loves us enough to redeem the world, that God loves us enough to send us Jesus. This Jesus who left nothing undone, who gave his all, the one whom we are to imitate. This day, may we find the strength and the courage and the faith for that to be true. Amen.